From Sodom and Gomorrah, this is Common Filth Radio, episode 32. Thanks for listening. I got the cassette player hooked up here as I open it up. And the cassette says race, prejudice, and hatred. And it's, um, I believe, a religious uh, sermon. It's uh, some kind of sermon from a church some time ago. So we're going to play that. I actually feel like a professional here. I got more than one thing hooked up to my interface here, so... Pretty cool. You guys voted, and this week I will be reading the My Body, My Choice tag on Tumblr. And in honor of that, we're going to be reading some articles from none other than Exo Jane. So I think we're going to have some fun here today. I will not be reading questions. I will not be answering questions this week because the mailbag is pretty light. I went through a lot last week when I probably shouldn't have, but don't worry. I'll get to them next week. So in honor of intersectionality, which just means how many shrill college liberal opinions can I have at one time. We're going to be listening to this cassette, which is anti-racism told from a religious perspective. Anti-racism is really a personality defect because when somebody describes themselves as anti-racist, all that means is that they're going to be nice to people just because they're a certain color. And I find that to be incredibly pathetic, but... We're going to give this cassette a fair shot here, and I have no idea what's on it because I've never listened to it, so we're going to be listening to this for the first time together. All right, let's cue up the second track here. Hit play. That's an ugly sound. Okay, tonight we're going to talk about a poison that is coursing through the veins of this nation. Even tonight, this poison is out on the streets of our country roaming the land. This poison is prejudice and racial prejudice. I think it's a very timely message because you don't have to go any further than your, the front page of your newspapers, your television, even on the job. Any and everywhere you go, this subject is coming up over and over and over again. When I said it was timely, I, that's not really true because really we're probably about 40 years too late. This is, it's far past the time and, and it's far out of control. So really, we're actually a little bit late getting into it, but it's better late than never, I guess. The devil is planning on preparing to destroy, to blow this nation apart at the seams with this area. With this destruction within, he is going to plan on causing you and I to be polarized. He's going to try and pull you and I off of the center mark, off the trail that the Lord has us on. And in doing that, he's going to render us ineffective and and unable to do the things that the Lord has given you and I to do. Maybe something we can see now we're supposed to do later on when this happens and it blows apart. If we're not standing squarely on the scriptures on this subject, we're going to be pulled off. We're going to be pulled off the course that he's anointed us for us to be on. The thing about prejudice is prejudice is so much like that leaven that leavens the lump. All it takes is just a very little bit just a very little bit of prejudice in our life and it spreads throughout the rest of us and it spreads at such a, a tremendous pace that everything else is polluted all the rest of it is, uh, of us all the other things we do for the Lord can be destroyed because of this this area so if we're going to stand squarely on the scriptures so that when this stuff does explode we'll be standing above the problems we'll be standing on the higher ground of the word of God we're going to have to know what the Bible says about it so let's Let's stop right there. Do you think that racial cuckoldry is the higher ground? Because I don't know when this was recorded, but that seems to be the end result of anti-racism. And I'm not talking about racism in terms of I see somebody I don't like who's a certain race and because I don't like this certain race, I'm going to kill them. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about racism as we understand it now, which is basically, I acknowledge that there are differences between races. I acknowledge that there are divisions between races because there are incompatibilities. But instead of dismissing this man's ignorance offhand, he lived in a different time period. Let's continue. We'll be standing on the higher ground of the Word of God. We're going to have to know what the Bible says about it. So, let's get to the Scriptures. Get out your Bibles and uh, turn them to John chapter 4 and verse 7. Now, there are numerous examples in the Bible about prejudice. This first one here is going to be about the woman at the well and her prejudice against the Savior. You seem to get a lot of rain, Jace. 
In chapter 4 and verse 7, it says, There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. I want you to notice that she's the one that brings up the ancestry. She's the one that brings up where he's from, where she's from, that he shouldn't be asking her for this. And yet, if you notice in the end of that, she's going to blame him for his prejudice. Something's wrong with this picture here. She's going to blame him for prejudice, and yet she's the one stirring it up. Now, I will give you that the Jews were very prejudiced against the Samaritans. And it could have been because of some of the hurts or the, the prejudices that her ancestors felt or, or those around her felt from the Jews that she was turning it or venting it toward him. But this is how prejudice works. The individual that is being accused of prejudice is usually being accused by someone that, that is being prejudiced. She accuses him of her own problem. You know, I was growing up, I was taught that be careful of pointing your finger at somebody because you always have three pointing back at you. That's exactly what she's doing. Now, at a young age, I learned that whenever I was pointing anybody, I learned to do it like this. That's, that's a true story. Anyway, she's denying the fact that she has this prejudice in how she's treating the Savior, and yet, really, doesn't it draw more attention to her? That's the same thing that happens. It just occurred to me that God is prejudiced. I mean, this guy would probably tell you that before your sperm reaches the egg, that God knows everything about you, everything that's going to happen about you. That's prior. That is pre-existence. He's mixing his worldly, timely values with scripture, ignoring historical context. So, allow me to as well. But anyway, stand up and say this one or that one is prejudice, is acting prejudice. In reality, they really are. And not to say that the other groups weren't or whoever they were accusing, but in reality, this two way street is showing itself. They are acting very prejudiced in their actions. This prejudice is a two way street. We have to remember that. If there's one key element, one thing we have to get down from the beginning, I want you to realize that there isn't one group, one type of people that's responsible tonight. But. Racism is privilege plus power. Sexism is privilege plus power. That means one group is absolved of all responsibility. That's how responsible. It's a two-way street. It works both ways. I'll give you another picture, another example of that. In the Old Testament, Joseph in Egypt, the second time his brothers come to the land to get the grain that they need during the famines. They come to Joseph and uh, he, they bring Benjamin and he throws a big banquet for them. It's in Genesis 43, 32. If you go there, holy place in John. Anyways, his brothers come and he throws this big banquet for them. And as he throws this banquet, some really strange things happen. First off, he sets their places up by their ages and they think that's very weird. He gives extra food to Benjamin and they, they still don't know who he is at this point. But in verse 32, it says, and they set on for him by himself. That means those preparing set a place for Joseph. He had his own table, his own spot, separate from everybody else. And for them by themselves, that means his brothers. They set another table for his brothers, separate from him. Uh, and for the Egyptians which did eat with him by themselves, for the Egyptians which did eat with him by themselves, because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews. That is an abomination unto the Egyptians. We know that the Jews were very separated. We know that they were separated from the people of the land, but also the Egyptians were very much divided as well. It was an abomination to them and their peoples to eat with the Jews. What I'm trying to show you is this, this thing works from, it doesn't matter what... Well, someone's not keeping kosher there. ...you are or what, what group you're from. This goes back to, although I don't have any scriptural proof, I looked, I didn't find any, possibly back as far as Babel when the Lord separated the peoples. There's been this separation thing, and it works in every single people. Though the Jews were separatists, here we see the Egyptians. It doesn't matter who you are, no one escapes it. Now, we go back to John, there's another example of uh, this prejudice. So this is where the disciples were prejudiced against her in verse 27. It says, And upon this came his disciples, and they...
If you maintain a separation, there is no prejudice, because there's no interaction, at least amongst the common people. So, by doing this very simple thing of maintaining a border, maintaining a culture, a distinctive culture on either side of those borders, you avoid this problem altogether. Let's listen to a little more. This is where the disciples were prejudiced against her in verse 27. It says, and upon this came his disciples, and they marveled that he talked with the woman. They marveled, or they wondered that he was speaking with this woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? See, this woman, she was a woman, and religious leaders that day didn't speak in public with women. But on top of that, she was a Samaritan. She was one of those hated, despised half-breeds. They were half Jew and half Assyrian. And it bothered his disciples that he, their example, would be speaking to this woman, speaking to this Samaritan. It really upset them. See, they were prejudiced. Now, there wasn't a prejudiced bone in Jesus' body, but his disciples, we can't say the same about them. It, it upset them. Now, the, the thing I want you to see about their prejudice is their very common, hidden nature that was in their prejudice. Even though it bothered them enough to maybe talk about it among themselves, to bring it up, they did not say anything to the Savior about it. You know, if you had a problem or a question about what... what your leader was doing, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say something? But see, that's against how prejudice works. Now, there are different types and variations of prejudice. There's, from either end, there's the violent manifestation uh, that you would see. But for the most part, prejudice is very hidden. It likes to stay hidden. And this is a very good example. They wouldn't say, those that are prejudiced don't say anything usually out loud to those people that they're prejudiced against. They won't say it to people that even are, might not see it the same way as they do as the example here of the Savior. It likes to stay hidden. They like to keep it hidden. It's very subversive with the, the very differing degrees, and it's selective on who they tell. Okay, another example we'll talk about. It. Turn to Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. Here we're going to find the opposite example of prejudice. We're going to find Philip crossing racial boundaries to minister to someone. Acts 8 and 26. It says, An angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and he went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Ethiopia was south of Egypt. It was the African country known as the country of the blacks. Who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. He was the treasurer of the nation. He was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Esaias the prophet, then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself unto the chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Esaias and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? I want to give you a little background here. This is Philip. He was... Blanda up. But in all seriousness, I don't think this guy had enough foresight to realize what not being prejudiced would evolve into, which is you must prostrate yourself before those who are deemed protected by the powers that be. I suppose I was expecting something more cringeworthy, but eh, can't win them all. But we do have some cringeworthy stuff queued up in the tags here from Exo Jane, and I'm not going to link to this, so I'm going to link to the archive today because I don't want to give them any traffic. But we have two sides of the cringe spectrum. We have one that is slightly sympathetic from what I could tell, and the other is either evil or completely oblivious. We will decide on that together. But first, let's do the sympathetic one. The title of the article is called Strange Men Who Keep Calling Me Thunder Thighs. Stop it. Once... When I was around 9 or 10, I looked in the mirror and noticed I'd suddenly grown a fairly impressive pair of what can only be described as massive, childbearing hips. This was sad for several reasons, not counting the fact that the term childbearing hips makes me vaguely uncomfortable. First, I've never harbored anything close to a desire to have the kinds of kids that would come out of me, so childbearing hips are useless to me. What kind of kids do you want? Ones that don't come out of you? Hint. Those aren't really your kids. Second, this gave me an oddly proportioned body shape that was less Kim Kardashian, more great auntie. I was a 10-year-old built like a handsome and gracefully aging older woman. Well, that's what uh, too many hormones in the uh, 
system do? What is it? It's in the milk that causes early puberty, isn't it? I don't know. My mom would reassure me that I wasn't fat, but that I was substantial. I just had big bones, she'd tell me, and everyone's butt claps a little when they run. This is my truth to this day. I was walking alone on my way to meet a friend. Someone had given her a comp tickets to a play, so I headed towards the metro stop where I'd meet her. It's important to note here, at that particular moment, I thought I was the hottest shit. I had some kind of legging-centric outfit on, and I truly felt that I was a prime piece of real estate. I tend to think I'm more attractive than I actually am, but I think it would be accurate to point out that I looked exceptionally good, and if I met me at a bar, I'd make out with me in the bathroom. Oh god, any sympathy I had is just going out the window. I pushed the button at the crosswalk and was waiting for the light to change when I noticed a guy crossing towards the corner. He continued towards me, and I looked down at my phone as he passed because social anxiety wanted me to look down at my phone. Women.txt as he walked by me, I heard him say thunder thighs while I continued staring intently at my phone. He spoke with a bizarre cartoony game show announcer voice and put the same enthusiasm into thunder thighs as someone might if they were saying the amazing Spider-Man or ta-da and she's posting pictures of herself like how, how she thinks she looked at that moment and she, for fuck's sake. I looked up from my phone and realized I was sweating. The thunder thighs he was referring to had to be mine because I was the only person at the corner waiting to cross. The guy was standing there on the opposite corner waiting for his light to change. See, this story is getting way too detailed for me to believe it. I didn't have anything to say besides mumbling ugly stupid head under my breath when the light changed and I crossed the street. Oh, how quirky you are. See, look, this is... If it were a simpler story, it would be more accurate. I wasn't hurt as much as I might have been if this person would have calmly informed me in passing that I'm an utter disappointment to everyone I care about. I'd probably wonder how it is they acquired that information because no one can really know that. And being called Thunder Thighs isn't as bad, but it hurt enough that my Thunder Thighs and I cried silently through buried child for reasons unrelated to the drama of a dysfunctional family shattered by the rural economic downturn of the 1970s and the disintegration of the American dream. And here she has another picture of herself where she's in a long tee, long long sleeve shirt and some pants, and she's lifting up her leg, showing her thigh, and the, with the caption, "Can you even handle this thunder?" Oh my God! If if it bothers you so much, don't post pictures of it, which is more proof that this probably didn't happen. Anyway. A few months later, it happened again when another stranger I passed on the street called me Thunder Thighs, only this time they were accompanied by a group of bros who laughed as they walked away and probably bonded over their shared disgust that my thundering thighs had offended them to the very core, so much that they felt the need to let me know that they've been looking and they did not like. I wish I had some kind of empowered response that would totally make these people pee their pants and run away. <sighs> But I didn't because I was embarrassed and terrified and kind of disappointed at the lack of creativity I had been seeing there. Wait, you were terrified because, oh, you're disappointed, for fuck's sake. If someone is going to harass me and take time out of their day to tell me I didn't give them a boner, they might as well put some thought into it. At least call me a harlot or a churlish, churlish, churlish tart or something. She's using interesting words that I don't often encounter, at least once. I don't know why a stranger would want me to know that my thunder thighs do not, in fact, give them a boner. These people could have called me kinkles, muffin top, manhands, or what have you, but their reasons for doing it still wouldn't have anything to do with whether or not I actually have thunder thighs or that I was wearing leggings as pants. I could turn a t-shirt upside down and stick my legs through the sleeves and call those my pants. It still wouldn't have mattered. I've concluded that my thundering thighs were perceived as threatening and caused so many exploding synapses to the fine gentleman I passed that in that moment I caused them to question everything they knew to be real and fell into a spiral of disillusionment with life as they know it that at least this is the story I tell myself as I fall asleep at night holding it close to my little misandrist heart. This woman is crying out for help. She 
you could tell she wants a husband. She wants a life that isn't isolated. And it's isolated by virtue of the fact that she probably lives in a large city, but I would like you to pay attention to the timeline here. She, towards the beginning of the story, talks about the age at which she developed her womanly features, which was quite young. And during this time, she would be going to elementary school, where for eight hours a day, you are around teachers who don't know dick about shit, and you are also around other unsocialized, horrible creatures. And those creatures are not other government school employees, but children. Children are not very nice to each other. And Thunder Thighs is definitely something that I could envision a child saying. Now, I've stated before on the show that women are affected by experience differently. They are like, they're like elephants when it comes to personal slights. I hypothesize that this woman was thinking back on her childhood, her school days, and she probably was reminded of the comment she received, Thunder Thighs, on the schoolyard. Now, a sane person would dismiss this as kids are horrible people, the opinions of children mean nothing, whatever. I'm a different person now, I've moved on with my life. I barely remember what those people look like, maybe she does, I don't know, and they probably don't remember me. Instead of viewing this memory through such a lens, she repurposes this memory, which she obviously is still hurt by, and uses it as a vehicle to get attention, sympathy. So she makes up a story about looking at her phone as some guy says thunder thighs, which the phone part is actually the most believable part of the story because what urbanite woman, what, what one of these women would not look at their phone for more than a few seconds, a few minutes. And in saying all of this, I could be wrong, and there's nothing more to say about it than they're just assholes. These people are inconsiderate assholes, and that's all there is to it. That's assuming that it's true. I also have the suspicion that this article was written with the inspiration of not having any D not having a man in her life. And most red-blooded heterosexual men like women with hips. Hips are a sign of fertility, therefore are a sign that they are fit to carry on your genetics. But with that in mind, there are some major red flags here, like the, oh, my Miss Andrews tart, and the fact that she's posting pictures of herself in her article. It's almost like a dating profile in a weird, sick, roundabout way, but whatever. I'm giving this way too much thought, so let's move on to the I'm a sex worker and dating is an awkward daily negotiation. <sighs> when I entered into porn in 2011, I was in a relationship that I thought was going to last forever. And that's just in the title and subtitle, for lack of a better word. You thought it was going to last forever when you entered porn. Now, I know that you don't value duty and loyalty, but look at it from his perspective. He probably does. So when I found myself single a few years later and decided to enter into the dating world, I realized that my dilemma was twofold. Not only did I understand very little about how single people went about being a couple, but when I found one I might want to couple with, I had to figure out how to tell them about my rather unconventional day job. I know plenty of girls in my industry who have partners who are not in the business and who are quite happy. Yes, we call those men cuckolds. Contrary to what people will tell you, just as there are tons of people who would never date a sex worker, there are also plenty of people in prestigious occupations with designer educations that would love to marry a porn star. I don't understand what a designer education is. may not make sense to everyone, but it only has to make sense to the two of them. Wealth corrupts everyone. Capital to excesses. It, it does weird things to people. When I first became single, I had been doing porn for about a year, 
but I performed exclusively with women, which for whatever reason is more forgivable to a lot of people. Not to me. I wasn't really interested in getting emotionally invested in someone else, but I also didn't worry too much about what might happen if I ever wanted to date a civilian, since I wouldn't have to explain much more than that I had sex with women on camera sometimes. They'd probably get into a high-fiving contest with their friends. No, they wouldn't. In the first year of being single, I, ki I just kind of reveled in my freedom. What freedom? Being a slave to your vices? That's not freedom, honey. I was spoiled. If I wanted great sex with a hot guy who wasn't going to try to bog me down in emotional stuff, I could just call one of my coworkers. And so that's what I did for a while. Just slept with my work friends who kept it cool, but satisfied the physical urges with the added bonus of no explanations required. It wasn't until a year later when I started shooting scenes with men as well that it hit me. I was at a gas station filling up the air in one of my tires when a strikingly handsome guy pulled up next to me. He was like something out of a billboard selling cologne and drove a Mercedes and blasted band of horses. He wasn't exactly my type, but he was certainly good looking and he was confident. I know this is weird, but you're really beautiful and if I don't ask you for your number, I'll probably never see you again. His name was Paul and he had blindingly white teeth. I gave him my number. That night we were out on a date. He was courteous and lovely. He had just finished his bachelor's degree and was contemplating entering the police academy with an eye on becoming a detective. That all sounded great to me and I realized that I really, really didn't want to tell him about myself. Wonder why. The, uh, the dread is setting in. The shame. That icky feeling of shame. I mean, I was fine telling him about the town I grew up in that I dull majored in sociology and literature. <laughs> I like how she didn't mention, um... His uh, field of study. She probably feels uh, inferior because she studied something so stupid. And that I went to a prestigious writing program that I was working on my first novel. I didn't tell, mind telling him about the past three years I'd spent in New York working as an art model. Okay. Yeah, there you go. That's the new word for uh, pornographer or porn actress whatever. I just didn't want to mention what I did now. I love my job. I think I do something important in its own way. I perform in graphic narratives that people use to get off. I think getting off is a vital part of human life and one that we shouldn't have to apologize for. I also realize that reality is a long way <laughs> And in the meantime, I spend a lot of my time wading through the bog of shit that is other people's shame and rage as it relates to this, their sexuality. <laughs> Holy shit. So I didn't tell him. I justified this to myself with the notion that, hey, who knows if this is even serious and why weigh it down unnecessarily with all of the heavy lifting of institutionalized sexism that demands very specific sanctions against women that are empowered in any way financially or sexually, and most especially both? Why did she... Okay. Answer. No, no. That's not even a question. I mean, just writing about it is a headache. I can already hear everyone who hates porn weighing in with some hot take that's most likely based on irrational feelings rather than empirical truths, but I, I, I digress the irony of this coming from a person who thought, I'm going into porn and this relationship is going to last forever. Rationality shouldn't factor into any of this. Rationality when you want it, irrationality when you don't. Oh my god. We shared a sweet kiss, he had a firm body and a pressing desire, but was very respectful in a way that was so sweet it made my stomach turn. Yeah, because you're sickened by it. You know, like, this guy's a pushover. He's not a jerk. I drove home knowing it was an impossible situation, he couldn't really know me to know if things were going to work out without knowing the whole truth. That's a terrible sentence. But knowing the whole truth was likely to cut, to cut things off at the pass. I'm pretty good at sussing people out. And he dropped enough hints in the conversation over dinner for me to figure out that he'd have some questions about the porn thing and it would definitely cause some conflict. The chemistry was nice, but I decided he wasn't worth the trouble. I didn't despair long. My brother came to visit me for the holidays, touting the virtues of a new dating app called Tinder. The dating site seemed a little easier. I could put myself out there without any pictures from work, get some responses to people that were genuinely into me, 
and then I could come out if we made it past a few dates. My phone was buzzing immediately with more matches than I could keep up with. Tinder is a slash and burn campaign through the sexual jungle. I became precise in my rejection of people based solely on their looks, age, or interests. But once again, it's hard to get to really know someone without revealing a key piece of information, mainly that all of your income is derived from the sexual services you sell, and more than that, a brand that revolves around sex. As much as I tried to keep my job out of the conversation in the getting to know you phase of courtship, it's typical to ask what someone does for a living. Conversations became circular and weird, all dancing around the fact that I had this weird job that was going to affect just about every aspect of a relationship should it develop. See, even she knows that she's unfit, and she blames society, well, we have weird hang-ups about sex. Ugh, for me. Porn has taught me one thing absolutely, that people's sexuality is fractured and everyone is ham-handed about dealing with it, because it is a vicious animal act. It's shameful. It's like, you don't mind seeing your parents kiss each other on the cheek, but many people have been traumatized by walking in on their parents bumping uglies. There you go, it's shameful. Objectively. As clumsy as any negotiation about sexual politics has ever been, being a sex worker is like placing a loaded gun on the table. It was hard. I found some good matches on Tinder. I'm college educated and I'm a writer. <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? That's the second time you've mentioned that. No one gives a shit. They probably just want to fuck you. They're not interested in the relationship you are. Yet you're in porn which makes it impossible, and will make it probably forever impossible. Because you can't undo it. That What you do is not going to go away. Anyway, I have a lot of interests that aren't necessarily common among my work peers. I come to the job with a somewhat unusual background, which is fine for friendships. But when it comes to developing more intimate relationships, it can be more challenging. Tinder was dangling some pretty sweet fruit in front of me. A guy with six-pack abs kissing a dolphin with a graduate degree in comparative literature? Ugh. Oh, wait, did I say that right? No, that's me saying that. <laughs> I realized that I had to start telling people. I made a made up a pat response when a guy would ask me to tell them about myself, what I did, etc. I would reply with, writing is my life, I travel a lot, but not to anywhere interesting, usually San Francisco or Vegas, sometimes New York City. I love history and music and I have a pit bull rescue named Coco that I'm over emotionally attached to. This is something she is sending people, this long thing, and it keeps going on. <laughs> my iPhone is my life. <laughs> I live out of suitcases and I haven't unpacked most of my furniture yet. Netflix is like weed to me and I have a diet that involves things called cheat days and shame spirals. You work in porn. You think those things are uh, related? Maybe. Just maybe they're related. I like the words over much and ever more. I'm a feminist and progressive and I have a graduate education and really strong views about the wage gap. I write for an edutainment program about history on YouTube. I have a podcast, and also I'm a porn star. You know, if you just said I'm a porn star, it would probably be a lot more noble than the rest of that shit. If you just said, oh, I'm a porn star. But no, you had to, uh, you had to say that your iPhone is your life and that you're addicted to Netflix. God damn. This little chunk of text actually served me well. Most guys weren't scared off by my admission. What I learned is that a lot of people know someone who is in the adult industry and a lot of people don't really mind potentially fucking a girl that fucks professionally. Oh no, shit, really? <sighs> what I did find was that no matter what, it would shift the tone of the conversation. Now guys would want me to send a selfie. They'd tell me how sexy I was despite the fact that uh, I wasn't using anything more than fully clothed, decidedly neutral pics from my iPhone on my profile and my bio read, Doe-eyed intellectual giant seeks Marcus Aurelius type for disordered romantic attachment. Of course, too, they wanted to know all about my work. Most correspondences devolved into these vaguely sexual 
exchanges. There's an assumption that you want to engage with people's erections at all times. You're so sexy, can you maybe send me a selfie? I understand it's meant as a compliment, but the problem is that most of my interactions are based on my looks. And the main thing I'm looking for when I decide if I'm going to date someone is a sense of rapport. It's a subtle thing, but it's there. The feeling that men get overwhelmed with the idea of a porn star. These people are not sane. In a healthy culture, people like this would be institutionalized. Most of my interactions are based on my looks. I'm an unrepentant whore, a porn star. I am a I am one step removed. It's one step removed from a prostitute. Yet I'm going to complain that my interactions are based on my looks. I don't really hold any of this against people. There's no guide to dating a sex worker and I hardly expect anyone to get it right on the first go. Having been an adult for a while, I've seen relationships that work and ones that don't, but the rule is that every couple is unique and they all have to negotiate the very normal human feelings of jealousy, insecurity, and self-interest. I found myself in a mire. Tinder was too sexually charged for me because I was a sex worker. Not in the fun way where everyone wants to fuck you, but in the unfun way where everyone wants to be unabashedly honest with you about their sexual desires and hangouts because you're not a normal person anymore. You complain that people are ashamed and rageful towards their sexuality, yet you're complaining that people only like you for your looks. You're complaining that People are being honest with you after you were honest with them. Because I think that's a pretty good way of uh, establishing honesty. Oh, I'm a porn star. <laughs> yeah, and I want to fuck you. If, if somebody tells you that they're a porn star, you're probably likely to tell them anything because it's less shameful by comparison. <laughs> anyway, I think this is almost done, I hope. I deleted the app after four or five conversations that all ended the same way. Opening joke to seem charming. Charming response back. You seem pretty clever. What kind of history are you into? What do you write? I have some part of the French Revolution that I'm interested in and ask them about something in their profile. You from here? What do you do? Cut and paste past Pat response. Oh, wow. Interesting. Sometimes it's usually just a fun job. I guess we can do anything we want. Winky face. Dismayed silence. Hey, sexy girl. Exhausted non-response. You still want to hang out? <laughs> I decided to abandon dating sites for simply relying on people I met through Twitter or through friends. <clears throat> people who already know what I do. I've had to become very zen about dating. I wait for potential partners to come to me. Yeah, I'm impatient, so it is challenging, but the results have been somewhat surprising. A lot of really interesting people are actually very open to the experience of dating a girl in the sex industry. It's like the institutionalized sexism I've toiled under all my life was telling me lies. These aren't people that are going to keep you around for very long because they're going to realize I have to introduce this person to my friends and family at some point. You're looking at the short game, honey. When you put it all out there, you get some really amazing things back. Yeah, like the fact that people are open with the fact that they want to fuck a porn star. Because, again, it is less shameful than being one. I have a podcast where I interview comedians, and I found a guy from New York I really wanted to have on. I saw he was coming to L.A. in the near future, and we struck up a conversation on Twitter that quickly went to text. We had a good rapport. We decided to meet up at a show he was playing. He was stunning, attractive, intelligent, and with the kind of magnetism that made it feel like you'd already seen him on his own TV show. After his set, we met at a bar and talked about a way to get him on my show. He was leaving soon. He was curious about what I was about, what I wanted to do with my life, what my ambitions were. I tried to explain the premise of my show. 
I know most people won't care that I think about things because I'm a porn girl, but I'm trying to sneak it in there. I figure if I bring comedians, they'll be more inclined to listen to someone like me talking about ideas by bringing... How does that work? My ex-girlfriend was an escort. She used to say the same thing, he said. And he said it without a trace of shame or judgment. Oh, no shit. A comedian who's hopelessly broken and dysfunctional. And I think I cracked a smile for the first time since I started on all this nonsense. We weren't on a date, and this wasn't a romantic encounter, but it filled me with hope. <sighs> that you met somebody as damaged, hopelessly damaged as you. That's what gives you hope. Well, you are filled with hope, and I am filled with nothing because nothing really surprises me anymore. Am I surprised that she is a bundle of contradictions and doesn't realize a basic input-output relationship? I am not surprised by that. Am I surprised that because she is left alone to make her own decisions, her cognitive dissonance is amplified and leads her down certain paths because she does not have an institution to redirect her passions? Not in the least. But what I am surprised by, the only thing that surprises me about all of this are the desperate cries for help. And the way they are expressed. This woman has fucked up tremendously. And on some level she realizes it. And the only comfort she gets is that there is somebody out there as fucked up as she is. And that is the only comfort she has. And she tells the world through a website... Who will just say, you go girl, don't worry about what other people say, without addressing the fundamental issue. They're just using her to get clicks. Just as various merchants of smut have used her to get money. Look what these people have done with their liberation. Look at what these people have done with the benefit of the doubt. Oh, you guys were oppressed. Now you're free. And now you are falling into a worse situation than you had before. But nobody's going to say it. The culture won't say it, but I will. But who am I? I'm just some sexist bigot who doesn't know anything. Anyway, I got the My Body, My Choice tag queued up in the first post... Nudes. After shower feelings are my favorite. <laughs> and her avatars meows internally. This blog is dedicated to help me become more and more comfortable in my own skin. Love yourself by posting nudes of yourself. I should have known then. You do not get to judge a woman by how many people she slept with. You do not get to judge a by the sex she likes to have and the sexual things she likes. Well, if that's how you're going to present yourself, we are going to judge you by those standards. What a woman does with her body is her business and not yours. You do not get to judge a woman on anything that has to do with her body. You do not. Do not, I fucking repeat, do not get to judge her about her sexual acts and her number of partners and proceed to tell her that you want to have sex with her. It does not work that way. If she's less pure because of the people she's been with, what does that make you once she's slept with you? It is 2015. And it's 2015. Why? Well, just wow. Well, realize women have sex. We fuck. Again, we have sex just like anyone else. So get over it. Get over it. This girl's. Okay. 20, mom to three children. And engaged to a man 12 years older than me. Okay, well, 
I hope those are his kids. I don't get why other people are so concerned about the status of my uterus. Friend. So when do you have another? And make it an even four. Me. I'm not. I plan on getting my tubes tied, tied once I'm old enough. Friend. No, don't do that. You're young and might want more when you're older. Me. I've been changing diapers and making bottles and always had a baby crying for the last five years. Trust me, I'm good for the rest of my life. Friends. Doesn't... Yeah, whatever. You know, she probably just wants to fit in with her friends because she is very young. And all of her friends are probably into this pro-abortion nonsense and she wants to be a part of it. Even though she's had three children already. I was creep blasting the cat's tag and accidentally stumbled into an anti-choice tumbler. So that was not fun and I didn't even get a chance to blast my creep juice all over any what the fuck? What? Creep juice all over any cat pics. I don't know. Well, I don't, I don't want to know what that means. I really hope it's something more innocent than what it appears to be. It sure was nice being judged by my nurse today when she found out I was a 20-year-old virgin. Virgin. She wasn't judging you. She was probably like, oh my god, they do exist. <laughs> uh, today I was told by a girl I work with, and I quote, you're too pretty to be a virgin. First of all, fuck you. Second of all, how dare you. Third of all, leave this planet. Even the objectively decent girls are wanting to signal. <laughs> Fun fact, picking out clothes is hard, and she posts a picture of it's from Snapchat, I think. And she posts a picture of her in her underwear and like some shirt that uh, meets between her belly button and the bottom of her breasts. That's where it stops. <laughs> Stand up for your rights. Your right to what? If you protest and do everything possible for me to be born, but not to receive love, education, food, and shelter, then you are not pro-life. You're only pro-birth. What, it's, it's your right to go double major in sociology and literature? That requires somebody else. That requires that somebody else exists in order for you to get that. It's not something that is endowed by any creator. I hate the fact that as a minor, my parents treated me like my body wasn't mine. It isn't yours, it's theirs. They could grab me, ground me, hit me for disciplinary reasons, judge me, control me, etc. As an 18-year-old, I chose to get a tattoo for several reasons. The most important being that it makes me happy. You didn't have one before. You never got one before. So how can you know that it makes you happy? Being stuck with something for the rest of your life. Something you will likely outgrow. Never mind, you won't outgrow it. Now they're mad at me for mad at me because doing so and not telling them is disrespectful. In my opinion, they're more mad about me doing something to my body of my own accord without their say so since it is no longer necessary. I don't know, it just frustrates me. Well, you get one tattoo and the next thing you know, you're writing exogene articles complaining that you can't get into a relationship because you decided to pursue a career in pornography. That's just how it goes. That's how it goes. If you can't trust me with a choice, how can you trust me with a child? Actually, a pretty good argument. If I want to be promiscuous or do whatever I want with my body, that is my right and my business. I am a young, strong woman. I, I can and will sleep with whoever I want. That does not make me a slut. My body, my life, my choices. You are a crybaby princess. That's what her profile says. I don't care if you think my natural hair color is pretty and rare. If I feel like dyeing my hair green, you bet your balls I'm going to do it. I'm not actually going to dye my hair. I'm just saying, like I said, the even the decent girls are going nuts. 
Me getting really tired of your anti-choice bullshit. Go life. Go home. Mind your own uterus. I'm a woman, not a womb. Soulless dead eyes. More nudes. Body positive is such a cool thing. Now some people holding up signs. Was not aborted, turned out gay. Was not aborted, turned out to be gay, trans, pro-choice, liberal. So are you saying indirectly that you wanted to be aborted? We are the cutest protesters. That was in response. That's the caption to the, the signs that I just read the picture. The signs embedded in the picture. <laughs> um, another nude. And she has a bruise on her leg. And a tattoo just below her knee that says, Whatever. And a very large woman lifting the middle finger with her mouth wide open with a caption. To the closed-minded dickheads who are telling me I'm immoral for getting a tattoo. Fuck you. Suck my metaphorical dick. Well then. First thing I get when my mom walks in the door. Not, how are you? Not, how is your day? But... That outfit is very revealing. You know, she's your mother. She's beyond pleasantries. She is not the cashier. She's not the bank teller. She goes on to say, well, shit, sorry. I thought I should look nice considering that we we're going out to eat. My mistake for having boobs should have worn my nun costume. Fuck you. <sighs> yep, that's what she's saying. She's saying that, you know, you're going out to dinner with your family. Look like you're going out to dinner with your family. That's all your mother is saying. <laughs> I will not censor myself to comfort your ignorance. It looks like she has cut marks on... No, that's just a vein. Never mind. Some black and white artsy picture. Taken from the perspective of her breasts. Because it only shows her pierced belly button down. More nudes. And no, wait, no, these aren't nudes. It's just lingerie pics, and she's showing off her body here. She has a spiked collar and a uh, that nose piercing. I think it's called a septum piercing. Not sure. Caption: Learning to love your body is difficult, but well worth it. And there's uh, two women, one in the foreground with another one of them piercings, and one in the background who is lifting up her shirt to reveal her bra. With the caption, don't let me take photos with you. I don't take them seriously. No, yeah, you obviously don't. You you don't take yourself seriously either. <laughs> Buy for a dollar seventy-five. My body, my choice buttons. I'll pass. It's amusing to me that feminists will defend women being strippers, prostitutes, and porn stars on the basis of choice and empowerment, but describe the use of these services by men misogynistic, objectifying, oppressive, etc. Just an interesting observation. Good call. <laughs> Pro-life, I know what's best for your pro's choice. You know what's best for you. Well, given the articles that we've read, people don't know what's the best for them. Pro-life on campus. Really disgusted by the fact that there's a group of pro-lifers on campus with pictures of dead babies by the place where we eat. Can you not? Why? Are you uncomfortable with seeing the end result of you wanting to avoid the consequences for your actions? I wish I was born hairless ex except for the red hair. Oh, for the red hair. Oh, how am I seeing that? I wish I was born hairless except for the hair on my head, eyebrows, and eyelashes. Life would be a shit ton easier. What, so you could get sweat in your eyes? No, that wouldn't be very easy. The woman that yell what I do with my body is none of your business are the same women who want free birth control and abortions, aka having someone else pay for it. Well, nothing that I disagree with there. Why am I dressed like a slut? Why are you thinking like a rapist? <laughs> and she's covering her face. Probably because she knows that... Never mind. I think I need to start squatting in because my ass isn't half full as it used to be, but I'm gaining a lot of bulge on my tummy, but whatever, right? 
Also in need of breast augmentation. I love my body, but I want it to be better. You poor creature. Need more vegetables in my life, so I'm eating pizza and being all healthy and shit. <laughs> okay. Let's see what that has to do with this. Please leave people, uh, people who are against vaccines alone. Moving on. Maybe that's a troll. Leave anti-vaxxers alone. My body, my choice. <laughs> Here's a woman with, uh, you've probably seen this before. She has, still not asking for it, Sharpie on her body and she's almost completely nude. Women belong in the House and the Senate. <sighs> Why we need more women in Congress. Instead of paying to end abortion, you should pray to end rape. Pray to end rash decisions. Pray to end societal pressures that make a woman afraid to even speak about it. Pray to end a terrified girl in the bathroom trying to figure out how to raise a child while she's raising herself. Pray to end a woman crying and trying to rationalize a decision while there are sleeping children next to her. Pray for support for women and not hate. And of course, sir. Uh, avatars of a cat. So if abortion is murder, wouldn't that make miscarriage manslaughter? Shouldn't all these poor women who lose their babies for whatever biological reason to go to prison for unintentionally killing human life? I mean, it happens in their body. It's their fault, right? I shouldn't be born because me mom should have been in prison for years before I was conceived. Ugh, sorry, I'm so angry about this. I'm creating radical arguments in me head. I just want to scream. I'm pro-choice. I'm so very angry. Ugh, help. Miscarriages happen for a variety of reasons. And, um... Manslaughter is when you're doing something that's destructive. And, while you don't intend to kill anybody, you do intend to do that destructive, damaging act. So, I don't see where miscarriages fit into that. Just had the dumbest fight with my mom ever. Like, she actually told me how sad and disgusting, disgusting it is that I don't shave my legs slash armpits, although I'm a girl first of all. Mom, I'm not a girl. I'm punk rock, and your opinion is so medieval and shit that I'm going to vomit on your floor. Oh, my word. Is women's visible pubic hair really so shocking that it must be censored? By Jessica Valenti. Now that more women are... Okay, I'm not done. I'm... More nudes from that person we saw initially. <laughs> Snapchat pictures. Fuck you, Grimes, you sexist piece of shit. I'm going to wear leggings if I fucking want. My body, my choice, bite me. My chat, Snapchat story is great. My teacher is an asshole. <sighs> Pro-choice isn't about whether or not ending a pregnancy is murder. It's about women's rights to their own body, their right to medical care, regardless of their reasons. Keep telling yourself that. Don't ever, ever, ever let anyone make you feel bad for the choices you make about your body and who you show it to. But you still make yourself feel bad. I gotta be honest, I did not intend for this show to be that depressing, but eh, life doesn't always work out. So let's uh, close out with some positivity. Got some notes on the Bandcamp purchases. Got a note that says, I love you, XOXO. I love you too. Don't ever change. We've got uh, got some notes from Toilet Law, even though you just put Toilet Law. And Toilet Law is a uh, contributor over at the rightstuff.biz. And if you haven't looked at my interview that I did over there, go to the rightstuff.biz. Scroll down between two lampshades, common filth. It's good stuff. Another one that says, great job with the show. Another one that says, Heard you on TRS and love what you do. Keep up the good work. See? TRS. The right stuff dot biz. They're, they're great. They're, they do articles and podcasts. Here's your fucking shekels. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thanks a lot. 
Hey CF, I listen to your podcast on my commute home from work every day and often when I'm painting models. Thanks for the great content and helping put things in a new perspective for me. Keep on keeping on, brother. Signed by Evan. Thanks a lot, Evan. And thank you to those who didn't leave a note but bought the stuff on Bandcamp anyway. And if you want to do that, uh, everything's $2 on the Bandcamp page. And if you want to pay more, you can definitely pay more. And if you have Amazon.com purchases... You should know how that works by now. And before I go, I should have mentioned this at the uh, beginning of the show, but I neglected to do so. Starting on Sunday, two new episodes of Tumbleristas per week, uploading every Sunday and Thursday, and of course, Common Filth Radio on Tuesday. So three out of the seven days a week, I will be uploading something to this channel, which is... A lot of work considering that I am still working on Tumblrista's Raw Volume 2, and that should be out sometime around late April, early May. I'm still, it's still in the early stages, so I will update you all on the progress of that as progress on the project happens. I, um, I sold myself short a little bit on uh, making Tumblrista's Raw Volume 1. That actually took me uh, shorter than what I was expecting. The month I announced it is the month it came out. Maybe it was like a little more than two weeks between uh, announcement and uh, official release. But when I set myself on a deadline, I'm, I'm usually good about making it. So I am out of things to say on this show for this week. Tumbleristas on Thursday and another episode of Tumbleristas on Sunday. And hopefully every Sunday and Thursday after that. So with all that being said... Take care of yourselves. Be good to each other. See you later.